Hi, my name is Dave Esposito. In 2001, I donated a portion of my liver to my brother-in-law, who was terminally ill at the time with liver disease. Since then, both he and I are doing well and are living healthy, productive lives. Last year in this country, over 16,000 people needed liver transplants, and less than half of those people got liver transplants. And sadly, about 1,400 people died as a result of not being able to get a donated organ. I wanted this film to educate and encourage those of you watching who have a friend or family member with terminal liver disease to think about the information presented in this story and to consider becoming a living donor. Although there's a lot of knowledge you need to know and understand, and there are risks involved in living donation, I can tell you firsthand that if you decide to donate, you will have done a great thing, a once-in-a-lifetime thing. Our family wants to thank the transplant surgeons, nurses, social workers, and support staff who have dedicated their lives in a very profound way to helping one person give to another. When Sangri was getting close to the end, I, I really didn't think I was ever going to be happy again. And um, this gift from my brother was... Uh, it's, it's hard to even talk about because I didn't want to even live then. My name is Song Wei Son. I'm 61 years old and I live in Suffolk, New York. I teach at Sarah Lawrence College. I'm a violinist. I guess it's about 13, 14 years ago. I suddenly lost lots of weight. So I went to Dana Farber Medical Center and the head of the cancer unit said, no, I don't have cancer at the moment. And I should see somebody else. So again, I went to another doctor and then he found that I had um, hep B. Which apparently he had had since childhood. Um, it really came, I guess he was having an acute episode. At this point, he was very sick, very weak. He was supposed to die in six months. He had liver cancer. It was all over. I just remember at that time, it was very uncertain as to what was really wrong with Sun Ray. Sun Ray went through a battery of tests and it was determined that he was going to need a liver transplant, that his liver was failing rapidly enough that he was going to have to face this. Sun Ray had cirrhosis of the liver as the result of having had infection with the hepatitis B virus for many years. He had gotten this way back long ago. Uh, it's the nature of the liver to be able to handle uh, injury very well and so that it takes many years for a process of the, the damage to the liver that ultimately leads to a transplant to develop. But uh, over time, uh, the repeated injury and the liver's attempts to recover from the injury lead to the buildup of scar tissue in the liver, which ultimately reaches a point where it's called cirrhosis. And at that point, uh, a number of different things start to happen, and they started to happen to Sung Ray. Everything was going um, badly. My memory was going, and it was always very cold. And I couldn't sleep for days in an end. And I had cramps in my body. I couldn't move. And so uh, it was real torture. Pressure starts to build up in the blood vessels, in the spleen, in the stomach, the intestine, and in the esophagus, the, the channel that brings the food down to the stomach. Um, because the blood can't pass through the liver very well. Pressure starts to build up, the veins start to enlarge, and they can lead to, and did in Sung Ray's case, lead to uh, repeated episodes of rupture, bursting of these blood vessels, leading to episodes of internal bleeding, any one of which can be fatal, and they're certainly uh, scary and debilitating. Ultimately, the only solution is to, to replace the liver. And so he was put on a waiting list. Um, he had several more hospitalizations at Mount Sinai um, when he became acutely ill. And we really didn't know whether he was going to get a liver. 
there were people far sicker than he and it was explained to us that the liver would go to the sickest patient. My state of mind was awful because it was always dealing with the unknown. It was always dealing with, is he going to have a bleed? And we were kind of always waiting for the other shoe to drop. Well, we had been hearing uh, bad news about Sung Ray's health, and every time we talked with Pat, it was going from bad to worse, and we were very concerned. And just by blind luck, I happened to uh, read an article in the New York Times about uh, liver donation, live donation, and we were just astonished. We had never heard of this before. We didn't know if it might be possible, but we just decided we should talk about it and see if it might work for Sung Ray. When I heard Ann uh, tell me about that article in the New York Times, I basically made up my mind right then to try to become a live donor. Um, it didn't seem to me that Sun Ray was going to make it. I think if he would have died before he had gotten a cadaveric uh, organ. Um, and this just seemed like the perfect way for him to get a transplant while he was still strong enough to hopefully pull through the operation. I remember at the time being surprised that Pat and Sun Ray didn't seem to want to talk about live organ donation with myself and Anne, uh, or whether they didn't know very much about it. They, they just didn't seem very communicative about it, and I wasn't sure what was going on. We were so focused on a cadaver providing a liver in time for Sun Ray that we didn't even consider the possibility of a living donor. It wasn't mentioned to us. I didn't even know about the living donor situation. I didn't know somebody actually can give. I thought I'll be dead. So I wound up giving the transplant center at Mount Sinai Hospital a call and I wound up going in for an interview with a social worker who gave me an orientation to becoming a live donor for Sun Ray. And uh, I do remember she also asked in a number of different ways whether I was feeling any coercion or pressure from family members and I said really no, just the opposite. I I was pressuring to become a live donor. I, want, I wanted the process to move forward as quickly as possible. Back in 2001, when Dave and Sun Ray went through the living donor process, things were very different. Currently, there are a lot of state and federal regulations around living donation, and most of these have been put in place to protect the donor. Now every transplant program has a team approach to living donation and so recipients are educated about the need for transplant and living donation is presented as an option to them in most cases. Yes, my name is Emmanuel Malik and I'm interested in becoming an organ donor. I have a family member who is sick and I, I'd really like um, to help out if I may. If there is somebody who wants to be a living donor in the family or a friend who's interested in doing that, they call the transplant program and they have a separate evaluation by a separate team. And this team would consist of a physician, a surgeon, a nurse who's a transplant coordinator, a social worker, and a living donor advocate. And this person's sole job is to make sure that the donor understands the risks involved and that there's no coercion that exists and really helps them to make the decision. Many transplant candidates are hesitant to talk about the possibility of living donation with their family members. They feel like they don't want to burden their family members or their loved ones with such a difficult decision, or uh, they're thinking about the well-being of their loved ones and wouldn't want to put them in harm's way. It's also important for transplant candidates to keep in mind that their loved one may be waiting for an opportunity like this as in living donation, and they might be upset, the loved ones, if they're not given this opportunity to help in this way, to learn about the option. As I learned later, um, Pat and Sun Ray were having some of these concerns themselves. We started to feel very awkward around David. Does he really want to do this? What about his wife? Uh, how do we even talk about these things? I knew it must be difficult for Pat and Son Ray to consider having a family member as a donor. But, you know, there just seemed no question in my mind that as long as I was a suitable donor physically, that this was obviously the way to go. The chances were good for both of us. Now I think about it, I think, well, you know, sure, I wanted it to happen, but Sun Ray could have turned down me as a donor. He could have just not wanted to risk a family member. And I've told him, I've told him in subsequent years, you know, if he had done that, I would have, I would have probably murdered him myself. I don't think I've ever had a physical as thorough as the one I had um, at Mount Sinai in order to become a, a living donor. Um, I had x-rays, 
uh, an MRI, I visited a blood uh, doctor, um, also uh, a cardiologist, uh, and a, a psychologist, and a social worker, all of this in one long day. In general, the screening uh, uh, process for, uh, for living donation, the living donor evaluation, it, it's a very extensive process and entails uh, uh, a big group of uh, healthcare providers to evaluate the donor from every single aspect, uh, from, uh, from a medical aspect, a surgical aspect, and also s psychological and psych psychosocial aspect in order to be uh, a, a living donor. A living donor needs to be a healthy person uh, with a healthy liver, specifically cannot have any defined liver disease ideally should be not much smaller than the recipient and in some cases where the donor is significantly bigger it even uh, gives us the advantage of being able to use the left lobe rather than the right lobe of the liver which makes the procedure safer since the left lobe is 35 percent and the donor is that much farther away from trouble. The blood type has to be compatible and not necessarily identical. For example O is a universal donor so that if the donor is type O it doesn't matter what type the recipient is uh, the donor can give. Apart from the medical uh, aspects, uh, it's important that there be a connection between the donor uh, and the recipient. Uh, in the United States, at least, it's, it's illegal to sell organs, uh, and the donor has to have a legitimate reason for wanting the recipient to remain alive and well. Not long after my screening, I was given the okay to become Sunray's donor, and then they basically told me the next move was up to me as far as scheduling the transplant. And I, I wanted to do it soon, the sooner the better. And the idea being that Sunray would be able to be operated on while he still was fairly strong, and, and everyone else seemed to feel that, that was a good idea too, so we pushed for sooner rather than later. David was given a date um, in December, uh, and suddenly there we were. The sense of time going into the week of the transplant was really, uh, everything accelerated, it was like a train just going down the track inevitably and um, the, it was looming larger than life. I think we were all focused on uh, the new beginning, you know, what was about to happen. Um, in, in less than 24 hours, Sunray would have had his operation and hopefully we, we'd both be doing well and it would be like a new life. I was just walking around in fog, I guess. And then when we actually walk into the uh, surgical place, then I realized, you know, it's going to happen. And, and then I was out. The day of the surgery, uh, it's, it's essentially what we say, it's a full day event for everybody. Uh, for the donor, for the recipient, for the donor team, and for the recipient team. We can't look at a liver and say, well we, well, we need about this much. We have to divide the liver at the point between the left and the right lobe so that each side has its uh, complete blood supply. We are obviously doing these two procedures at the same time in adjacent rooms in order to minimize the time that the donor piece of liver will spend out of the body. So we'll be consulting back and forth, you know, are you ready yet? No, give us a half an hour, so we'll take a little break uh, until the, the recipient room is ready. When everything looks perfect and all bleeding is stopped and things are controlled, we close up, uh, close up there. And next time I woke up, I felt suddenly, really, I can think suddenly, and I was warm for the first time in many years. So it, just dramatic change that I felt and I didn't have a lot of pain and my body seemed like it's my own again. I remember waking up and feeling pretty done in. Um, I, I remember laying on the, uh, on the bed and I couldn't turn the room right side up. Everything was sideways. Um, uh, I also remember the first few days I, I couldn't sleep real well and I, I would go to sleep and I think it was morning and maybe two minutes had gone by. And so it was a long, <laughs> some long nights. Um, the first week was pretty tough, yeah. 
When a donor has an operation, they're usually in the operating room for about four or six hours. And after that, they spend some time in the intensive care unit, usually overnight, and then are hospitalized for about five to seven days. They go home and they don't feel all that great. And usually they're back to work about six weeks after donation, but they don't feel 100% for about three or four months. I was 48 at the time of the transplant and within six weeks I was back to work. Within three months I was bicycling 15 miles a day to and from work. Um, like most transplant uh, donors, I've had really zero long-lasting after effects from the transplant from having been a donor. Sunrays had a few issues, a few health issues though, like many transplant recipients, and he continues to have a few. Even now, it's nine years later, uh, if I do something you know, weird with my body, I, I still feel the pain, but that's just minor thing you carry. And you realize, I guess it's a reminder that you did have transplant. Over the last few years, I, I really hadn't given the transplant all that much much thought. It seemed like, uh, you know, days and weeks and even months would go by without much of a thought about it. But it was just an amazing experience um, to have Sunray be okay, to have my sister not have to be a widow ten years ago. I feel really good about that, and of course. I feel really good that medical science was there to take us through this. This gift from my brother was, um, it was a gift of life for me as much as to Samurai because, you know, here he is and he's relatively well, he's had some complications, but he works, he functions, he's a violinist, he gives concerts, he's doing everything he wants to do, even gardens and swims, so, you know, can't argue with success. <laughs> If it hadn't worked, then it would have been completely different. If it hadn't worked, you know, either Dave or Sungray might have been gone, or both. And so I think the impact is that they're both still here. You know, they're both still here, and we get, we get to have more time together. Living everyday life as just normal everyday life, it's not like that anymore. So it's, it's like, it's a very different way of looking at uh, life itself, you know, after the transplant. At this point, as opposed to maybe when I was uh, younger and more of a, uh, a surgical cowboy type if, if you want to say uh, I feel a little bit of trepidation every time we we, we, we start a case like this uh, and um, I'm thankful each time that things go well If I hadn't been able to donate to Sunray, my older brother, Joe, was ready to step in. And to me, in a, in a perfect world, there'd be a line forming for each and every person needing help. 